What's going on? So in this video, I'm going to be covering everything I've learned over the past five or six years that I've been selling uh, online and everything that you need to know to build a sales team. I've worked on offers uh, that are doing 100K a month, 250K a month, 500K a month. I even scaled Alex Sedlak from zero to 80K a month. You might know who he is uh, in the first 30 days working with him. And we've done a lot of different things for our clients, but the most important thing is that we manage the sales teams, right? We run the whole system, but the sales team is really what makes the engine move and what gets us the cash in the door. And so in this video, I'm gonna be teaching you everything that I know, uh, or as much as I could possibly think of when I was making this document. So being said, if you want this document, go ahead and hit the link in the description. I'll give it to you for completely free. All I ask is for your phone number, your email, and your name, that's it. And then I'll give you the document, I'll send it on over to you. So go ahead and get it in the description if you want it. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Yo, what's going on boys? In this video, I'm gonna be walking you through sales, how to do sales, and an entire masterclass on our sales process. Uh, that we use for our clients that do whether they do 5k a month whether they do 10k a month or whether they do those 100k 250k months uh, all of our clients use a very very similar sales process and that's what takes them from those 5 to 10k minimal amounts uh, all the way up to that you know 100k 250k a mil a month type of range right so in this video that's kind of what i'm going to be walking through i'm going to be walking through kind of a master class on sales how it works uh, and how we're leveraging it to the greatest capacity so let's get right into it all right so sales master class like i just said uh, this is what we're going to be talking about today so the sales mindset this is the first thing uh, and everyone likes to talk about mindset most people actually cook away so it's probably doing going to do me a bit of a disservice to even talk about this uh, but I do think that it's super important because I want to serve you. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the gist of this whole thing is in sales, you have an obligation to sell if you believe in your product. So the first thing is that you need to gain belief in your product, right? You need to know what your product does, how it helps people, you know, how it helps them reach their desires and move further away from pain. And that's what we're going to be talking a lot about in this uh, is getting them closer to their desired outcome and further away from those pain points and the things that keep them up at night, right? So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about in this, um, you know, in this video. And again, you have an obligation to sell, right? And my hair is like fucked up. I'm just like looking at it in the camera and like getting pissed off at it. Let me fix this real quick. Yo, that's actually so bad. All right. So sales is a numbers game, right? It is a game of volume, a game of frequency and how much you actually do. The more attempts that you make, the more likelihood that you will hit the target. And it might be even your percentage of closes will go up the more you do. Sometimes it's going to be law of large numbers, right? It's going to go down, but not always, right? So the biggest thing that we need to gain in sales is unity with the prospects. We need to be sitting on the same t side of the table as them. Literally, if you're in like a door to door, or a car sales type of thing, but you know, if you're just in a generalized thing, you need to get on the same side as them, right? That's the big thing. Um, and then again, belief, you need to believe in your product. If you don't believe in your product, you're not going to be able to sell it. And then it's not ethical to sell something that you don't believe in. So your pre-call process, um, there's a few different things that you should be basically doing in your pre-call process. First thing is the morning of, you should be sending them some sort of either mini webinar or VSL or some other sales asset, whether it be a company brochure, a YouTube video, whatever it is to make them read through that sales asset all the way through or watch all the way through it um, so that they can gain more context and you can go ahead and break those limiting beliefs and break the objections before they even hop on the call, right? So uh, the purpose of the sales asset, the way that we're gonna craft that sales asset, something that not a lot of people talk about, what we're gonna do to craft that sales asset is we're gonna write down 10 or so objections, your top five to 10 objections you get, and then just write down all of the different ways that you can handle those objections, right? So we're gonna handle those objections in a number of different ways. So if it's, I need to think about it, okay, yeah, here's how to handle, I need to think about it. Here's how to handle this objection. Here's how to handle that objection. Handle all those objections in that one video and that's how you're really gonna do it, right? Oh, I don't know if Amazon FBA is the best business model for me. Well, here's why Amazon FBA is the best business model. That's what we're gonna be doing in those sales assets, right? These videos need to be framed in a way that people see them from an outside perspective as a YouTube video, but it's actually really, really helping you progress that sale forward. Because again, the pre-framing process is gonna probably be the number one thing that I touch on in this video. The pre-framing process isn't the most important, right? If you don't frame yourself right, you're not gonna be able to close deals. So 
Typically before a call in the morning of, I'm going to be texting them that link and verifying that they're still good for the call. If they don't respond like within like two hours before the call, obviously if you have like a 9 a.m. call, not always applicable, um, but we don't take calls. We take calls usually from 12 to 8 for what we do um, for the business models that we're in 12 to 8 Eastern Standard Time, right? Maybe later, maybe earlier if we have to, if it's absolutely crucial, but that's the main time frame where we're taking calls. Um, so before those calls, in the morning of, I'm going to be texting them. If they don't respond the morning of, I need to be sending them another message and another message. I'm going to do a total of three follow-ups over messages. If they don't respond, we're going to call them. And usually you want to have a dialer call them up anyway the morning of. Uh, or if you know, you're doing your sales process yourself, you don't have a dialer, you don't have a setter, cool, just call them up and be like, hey, just wanted to check in with you real quick. I'm not going to take up too much of your time, but just want to check in uh, and see if you're still good for your call today at 3 p.m. Eastern. Does that sound right? All right, gotcha, perfect. Well, I'll see you then. Let's talk soon. Boom, done, right? So you can get a dialer as well. That's another easy, easy way to do that. Uh, but your pre-call process is super, super important, like right before that call as well, not just like what you need to do the morning of, but also what you need to do right before the call. So I always do the same thing, and this this is kind of old. Um, I don't do 20 push-ups anymore. I just take a set of push-ups to failure, right? That's the big thing. So whatever that is, complete failure. I, I need you to be breathing heavy. I need you to be piped up, right? I sometimes listen to some David Goggins as well or some sort of like motivation doesn't sound like the right word because you don't want to be in that, but you want to be in that state of just like I am him, right? The mindset that we want to be in throughout all of this, and I'm going to touch on this I think in the next few slides, is the I am him always mentality, right? You have to be him. And the way that you do that is by getting prepared and getting in that mindset, right? So I put my phone away. I have two phones, so I have an emergency phone and my regular phone. My other phone goes somewhere completely different. Um, like my business phone will go somewhere completely different. And then my personal phone, I have like 10 contacts on it or five even. Uh, that one stays with me. But other than that, that phone is away. I am you know, completely dialed in without distractions, right? Another thing that I like to do um, is just like sit there in the moment for like one minute right before that call and just you know pray for me i'm religious you know if you're not religious that's cool just think about what you're grateful for right think about all the things that you have and how grateful you are and just breathe get into that state where you're present and you're able to actually hear their their questions and be able to answer that stuff right um i'm not a big i'm not the biggest like spiritual motivational rabbi guru kind of vibe that's not me um but if that's you cool but that's what i do i typically just sit there um, and think for a little while about what I'm grateful for, the things that I have, and that kind of thing. Um, and that's a real, been a real game changer for me in the sales space as well. Another thing is I always take notes on my prospects. So I use Go High Level for everything. So I'm always going to be taking those notes on the prospects, and I'm going to review those notes as well right before that call um, so I have more insight into the prospect when I hop on that call. So if you're setting you know, just one appointment through the DMs, read through those DMs and be like, hey, what, you know, did this person tell me that they were from Wisconsin or did they tell me that they have a, a dog or did they tell me that they've tried drop shipping in SMMA before, but they're trying to get into, um, you know, Amazon FBA, for example, right? What have they already told us and what info do we already have and what can we use as ammunition in the future? All right, the pre-framing process. So frame is how people perceive you. Right? This is why in most businesses, even if they're not making that revenue goal, we like to place part-time setters and part-time closers and have them as different people. Um, or at the very least, if it's a creator, we're not going to have the creator close. Although the creator will have a higher close rate, it's not as scalable and it's not as trainable. Um, when you have someone else who's like, hey, this person's on my team, that person has more aura if you frame it in the right way. Right? And aura is what makes and breaks the sale. You have to have as much authority as possible. That's what really, you know, sells people, right? It's the authority and the confidence that they will get results. Um, value, like, let me pull this up real quick. So this is Alex Hermosi's value equation, basically, right? So we have the dream outcome, the perceived likelihood of achievement, the time delay, and the effort and sacrifice, and that is what makes up value. So we want to decrease the amount of effort and sacrifice. 
decrease the amount of time that it will take to get to that dream outcome. And then we want to paint that dream outcome as as prosperous as possible. And then in addition, uh, we want to make sure that it's very, very likely that they will get those results, whether that's slapping a guarantee on it or whatever it is. Certain elements will add into this, right? And part of this is frame. So let me find the presentation again. So yeah, big thing is you just have to be confident and confidence comes with belief, right? So you have to have a super, super strong sense of authority and literally all sales is at the end of the day is who has the biggest stick in the room, right? One of my mentors, uh, this pretty recently, um, when he sold us into his program, right? He showed up to the call. He was in a beautiful hotel. He had a bathrobe on. He was chilling there, enjoying life. His girlfriend was in the background. He painted the dream outcome. Right, that's what you should be doing. Or his now his wife. I don't know if they were married at the time, but they were like he just had aura. Right, you see him and you're like, hey, this dude knows what he's talking about. He's actually achieved something. If you show up and you're just like chilling in a college dorm, I mean, it's going to be a little bit harder for you than if you show up, you know, in a spot where you are just framed better. Right, you look at the stuff behind me. Like this is just like a Christmas tree. You know, it's decorated and shit, but I have a pretty nice background. Like if I spin this camera around, you can see this is my usual setup. I have hella shit over there. I have like boxes. There's my usual setup. I have like boxes and stuff back there. And that's usually where I like take my meetings and that kind of thing. Those boxes in the background, if someone pops into a meeting and sees I have four MacBooks on the wall, they're going to be like, damn, what's this kid do? Right? So that's like one thing I would say is even the background um, another thing I've seen is like people show up in a hoodie and have their hood on or even not have their hood on. Um, you don't want to show up in a hoodie. Like you don't want to show up just casual. Like I'm showing up in a tank top. You want to be like showing up in a polo shirt or something collared, even if it's something that's not super professional, show up and show that you are him. Um, I show up to a lot of my calls in a bathrobe now. Like I actually do that. And even like if I'm sending outreach looms or whatever, I'll like show up and I'll be like, yo. You're probably wondering why some ginger in a bathrobe is hitting you up. Um, that's a, just like another hack. It's just like show up and show that you have the biggest stick in the room because that's who wins the sale at the end of the day. The prospect has to be able to respect you and look up to you as well, right? So if the prospect doesn't look up to you, if they don't respect you, they're not going to be able to actually get what – if they don't respect you, they're not going to buy from you basically, right? They have to respect you as a person. They have to respect the product. And they also have to respect the company as a whole. And that's really what it is, right? There's the company, there's you, and there's the product. And they have to trust all three for them to actually buy, right? And their level of trust might not be 100%, but they have to trust in some level those three things. And so this will be a big thing for objections. Write that down. You have you, your product, and your company. Those are the three things that typically ruin or make or break a sale, right? urgency this is another huge thing from the pre-framing process a lot of people show up to the call five minutes early and they sit in there and then the person shows up five minutes early and you're already there and they say hey how's it going oh yeah i'm just chilling bro i'm just chilling i'm just chilling can't stand that i and i sometimes do this too but if i'm hopping on a call i'm not saying i'm just chilling i'm saying yeah man i'm super busy just onboarded a new client did this this and this I'm framing myself as someone who does this for a living and isn't just sitting around, right? So everything's about frame. Um, you have to like, I don't like to say you have to talk down to them because I don't think that ego is always the way to sell, but you do have to have a bit of an ego, right? You have to be him. Um, but one kind of trick that I use is to my calls. I actually genuinely use this because I have to most of the time. Uh, I have a lot of back-to-back -back calls pretty much every day. Like even if I looked at my calendar today, I've had six calls today um, and five of those were back-to-back -back, uh, and then one was an hour off, right? So I show up to my calls typically about an hour or about a minute to five minutes late uh, and I show up after the prospect, right? The prospect should already be in the meet before I hop into the meet. So if you're using Google Meet, you can see this. You can see, um, you know, it shows on there like, okay, this person's already in the meeting. And so that's very, very important that I've found at least is making sure that you're not showing up like at the same time or before them because it paints you as the less busy person. So I show, I, so, uh, 
holy shit, I can't talk. <laughs> I show up about a minute to two minutes late. Uh, and typically I say, hey, I just, I'm sorry about that. I just onboarded another client and we're going through that. Uh, or, hey, I was just busy in another meeting, whatever it is. Um, and, and that's kind of the way that I go about it, right? Um, another kind of trick to this, and, and again, don't lie about it, but like these are things where I've actually had these scenarios happen in the past, so I can use it. I'll be like, hey, yeah, uh, we just had a little bit of an error just come up because one of our clients who signed up um, actually took out a loan to do it, and they did this, this, and this. Just add as much frame as possible where people are like, oh, he took out a loan to do this? Wow, maybe I should do it too. And also, people move to where other people are. From a psychological standpoint, people move in the direction that other people are moving, right? So if other people are buying this product, they are probably going to want in as well. If you say, hey, yeah, this, you're the first person, people aren't going to buy it because they're just like, they don't want to be the odd ones out to test it out or be guinea, guinea pigged. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of how that goes. But you have to show them throughout the call time is extremely valuable. So after that call starts, and you'll see this in a minute, I usually say like, hey, um, you know, it, I have back to back calls all day today. Is it cool if we get right into things, right? And that adds more frame because they're like, damn, he's booking calls, especially if you offer anything like lead gen, where it's like booking calls, anything like that, super, super saucy. Um, so yeah, um, few minutes late, boom, fire. So this is our framework. And again, you can see that I did not write script. I wrote framework because you don't want to follow this word for word. You don't memorize this script. It's not a script. It's to be used as pointers, right? So you can kind of look through this. I'm not going to go over all this, but typically the way that I start off a uh, sales call is I say, hey, how's it going? Sorry about that. Had an onboarding call. Also, very important. Another thing I forgot on the uh, urgency part. If you're showing up late to the calls and you're doing this trick and you're using this hack, like, please text your prospects like a minute before. So if your call is at 5, text them at 4.59 and say, hey, might be a minute or two late, um, you know, just finishing up an onboarding call or just finishing up this, this, or that. Um, and, and they'll respect that, right? They're not going to be like, damn, he's late to the call. You have to, like, be the bigger person in the room. So that's kind of how that is. Um, but I usually hop in right like this, um, say, okay, yeah, so you booked in a quick fall call. I usually ask some stuff that's not in this script. This is kind of one of the ones that we use for uh, our clients and, and for us as well for our closers. But if I'm hopping in a call, like I'm just flowing. Like I don't stick to a script. But this is kind of like what I would say. I'd usually ask them a few, a few just like simple questions. Um, I'd say like, have, you know, how's your schedule been busy today? What have you been up to today? Um, you know, something like that. Or, and I also ask like where they're from. Um, and that's a good way because you can always play off of where they're from, right? They say, oh, I'm from Wisconsin. Oh, yeah, I went to Wisconsin Dells once, right? Oh, I went to, you know, wherever. Um, or I have family that lives out there. Oh, I can't remember where, but I have family that lives somewhere in Louisiana. Like, you can always say some shit like that. It just make sure it's like actually, I'm not trying to tell you to lie, but like sometimes you just have to build rapport. Like, that's just the aim of the game. Um, but yeah. So basically, we're going to ask them up front, okay, is it cool if we kind of get into things? You know, I'm going to ask some deep questions. Here's how the call is going to work. Give them the agenda, right? Tell them this is what is happening. Don't let them scatter themselves over asking you questions or thinking it's a value thing. It's not. It's this is what's happening. This is the agenda. Does that sound cool? And I ask a lot, okay, does that sound cool? Fire, fire. Okay, let's get right into things, right? So I ask, does that sound cool? Why do I ask that? Because then they've agreed to it. They feel like it's their idea now. They, they have agreed that they are cool with that. So first thing is just figuring out why they're here, right? So ask them what, what kind of inspired you to book in a call. Um, and, and again, a big thing here from the framing process, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute a little bit more in depth, but outbound prospecting versus inbound prospecting are two completely different things. They're two opposite sets of the spectrum, right? So, um, you know, I'm going to go into some of these calls might get deep. If I feel like it's a good fit, da da da, da we can help you, right? And then clarify why they're here. If they're not clear on it, we want to dig in a little bit more in depth and figure out what actually got them to come he in here. Again, through sales calls, we're looking at a few different things. I'm going to actually draw this out. We have what's called the bridge. And why the fuck? Hold up. All right, fire. Draw it here. 
So basically, we have the pane, which I'm gonna, just going to draw a P because I can't really draw here. And we have the desire, right? So people are always, no way. All right, fire, hold up. Let me redraw this. P and a D, which is for desire, right? And people are always trying to go away from pain and over towards desire. And so we have what's called the bridge. And this bridge right here is what we call the... I'm not going to even be able to write it. That's going to be your unique mechanism, right? So that is what you do. So your pain, you know, maybe it's, hey, people are working their nine to five. Their dream outcome is they don't have to work the nine to five. And your solution takes them from where they're at to where they want to go in set period of time. And that's how the bridge framework works, right? So again, we want to get as clear as possible. And we need to know exactly what those pain points are and exactly what that desire is. And that's where we come into fact, find, qualify. Right. And so um, from here, basically, there's a few different things that we do. Uh, situational awareness is kind of trying to figure out where they're at. Um, goal awareness is trying to figure out where they want to go and then figuring out what's been stopping them. The gap. Right. The gap is like the water under the bridge. It's the thing that's been stopping them from crossing through that river and getting to their desire. Right. So what's been stopping you? So, we, you know, we're looking to establish whatever that problem is um, and looking for a much more emotional driver than, uh, oh, I don't know, I just haven't done it. We're looking for something a lot more emotional. Something that's like, yeah, you know, I want to do this. Uh, I really want to like make money online. Why? Why do you want to make money online? Well, I want to be able to provide for my family. Bam! Emotion, right? Now we can play on that. Oh, I thought you said you wanted to, you know, be able to provide for your family and not have to work a nine to five um, and not feel like you're just stuck in the rat race, right? So we can use that kind of stuff uh, throughout that. So again, um, emotional drivers, anything from family to, you know, their life, if their life's just like shit, basically you have to figure that out, right? So we're going to insert a quick relatable story there so that way we, we can, you know, relate to them. They build rapport, um, especially if you're a closer who's gone through a program, which is where a lot of people find their closers. If you're a closer who's gone through a program and you've gone from point A to point B, Point out what your point A was and how you got to point B and, the, you know, build your own case study around it. And that's why we should be sending these people case studies before, right? That's what a case study is at the end of the day. It's a transformation. Um, and that's another thing. We're not selling a product. We're selling a transformation. We're selling the ability to go from point A to point B, right? So, yeah, we're going to ask them more about their pain point, how it feels, um, and everything like that. And again, you can get this whole thing down in the description. I'm going to leave a link um, to this entire document and this entire framework as well. Now we're going to paint that dream outcome as like a vacation, right? You think about, um, you know, going to Fiji. Let's just take Fiji, for example. You're taking a vacation to Fiji. It's nice. It's palm trees. It's the, you know, the beach, scuba diving, whatever you want it to be. It's Fiji. It's beautiful, right? Fiji is like what you sell. You're not selling the plane ticket there. You look at any airline advertisements, you look at like American Airlines, you know, whether it's even Spirit Airlines, whatever brokey airline y'all fly on, um, literally, it's literally just that, right? It's plain, but they're not selling a plane, they're selling the vacation. And so that's what we need to do. We need to figure out what that looks like to get away from that pain and to go towards that desire. And we need to ask a consequence question. So this is a question along the lines of, so what happens if you don't do this? And this is where I'll bring up risky questions, right? You have to ask super, super risky questions, things that feel risky. Um, and a lot of people are scared to do this. And I don't get why, because they're not really risky. They're just considered risky by your brain. Um, it's like going up to cold approach a girl, right? It's not risky unless you think it's risky. Um, you know, if you were eight years old and you didn't know any better, you'll probably go up, right? So that's kind of how you need to think about this. Um, you're going to have to ask certain questions that, are very, very like rigged question. It's like a lawyer asking questions about how it's, it's like the lawyer who asks questions that they already know the answer to, right? So what happens if you don't do this? Okay. So why do you think you would be a good fit for the program? Why should I pick you to come into my program? Right? Again, you have to present the value as so much higher than that money. You also just have to have the not give a fuck mentality. And this is, I am him, right? You have to have that mindset of it doesn't, I don't really care about your money. I'll even say that physically on calls. 
I don't really give a fuck about your money. I'm just trying to do you a favor here. Like I'll literally say it on calls. Um, so yeah. And then asking them, you know, are you sure it's a priority? Why is now? Why all of a sudden? Why do you need to do this now? These are questions that are framed in a way where they have to basically get rid of the objections themselves. And if you follow these things, you will be golden, right? Then we're going to basically reassert frame, tell them the program's not for everybody. Um, so why, you know, are, why are they doing it? Why is it now? Those kind of things. And is it something that they're willing to do right now, right? And in theory, they'll be like, yes, boom, fire. So the offer, this is another kind of important part is the offer. Um, so the offer is going to be different for everybody, but we're basically going to transition into that offer. I see a lot of people, so many salespeople, when they first get into sales, this is the biggest thing they struggle with, right? So, um, and, and let's say we were to help you out, what kind of support would you require? And then from there, you're going to kind of present the packages you see fit. Now, another big thing is you want to have multiple packages. If you just have one package, you're not going to be able to sell it as easily. If you have like a $3,000 package and a $6,000 package, you're going to say, so which one of those do you think would better suit your needs, right? So they will pick themselves. Um, but again, we want to have some sort of mechanism, some sort of methodology. Um, so yeah, you can kind of read through this. I'm not going to go all the way through it. And this is basically getting commitments. So these are all commitment questions. Um, these are like, why is it beneficial to you? What do you think is the most beneficial part? Um, do you feel like you'd be on the same page? Is this something you're interested in? Uh, and basically make them sell themselves. Like I have asked for clothes here, but you're not really asking for a close. You're just getting a close, right? They are closing themselves. They're telling you why they should buy. Um, so yeah, and then we don't ask them, you know, we, we don't ask them, okay, is this something you're interested in? That's never say that. Never say that. You basically say, okay, is this something that works for you? Okay, are you cool if we get it onboarded today? All right, bet. Uh, so the next step is to get you onboard. Don't say I bet. I don't know why I said that, but don't say that. Um, but so the next steps, we can get you onboarded to help you achieve X, Y, Z. We do take a small fee, uh, and that fee would be blank. We don't say the price until that point. After we say the price, we are silent. Silent. Should look something like this. All right, yeah, so it, you know, we can get you onboarded today. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of an onboarding fee, but um, for that package, you know, we typically charge 3K, and for the other package, we charge 10. This is why you always have a water bottle with you on a sale, right? You grab a sip of water, take a sip of that water, and just stay silent. The first person to talk will lose the sale 99% of the time. It's a determining factor, right? So you want to make the other person talk first. Um, so that's a huge, huge point there. Do not talk before they do. Uh, and then basically you're just going to ask them, instead of asking them, we're asking them basically different questions, right? What's the best email to send that payment link to? We're not asking them, okay, do you want to pay? We're saying, what's the best email to send that payment to? And this is where we do what's called the assumed close. We assume that they are in. We assume that they have uh, committed and they're already ready to go on that, right? And so this is when you're going to get hit with boom, objection. And this is where 99% of salespeople fail, right? So objections boil down to two things, logistics and the fear of whatever it is that they're going through, right? So there's, you know, the logical things such as uh, they need to sort out their finances or they need to transfer money or they physically can't pay at the moment, right? And this is where you have to have different solutions such as Klarna Afterpay, you know, these different buy now, pay later solutions um, or even just manual payment plans as well. Uh, if they need to transfer money, okay, put down a down payment. You need a system for that, right? Everything that you do needs to have a system for it. If you're not doing the math and looking at, okay, what's the ROI on this? If someone puts down a down payment, they're most likely going to pay the rest versus getting cold feet. Cold feet is what kills everybody. They think like, I've had so many people who are just starting out, whether they're going through my program or whatever, and they hit me up and they're like, yo, bro, I just closed somebody for 2,500. And I'm like, let's fucking go, bro. That's hype. Um, you know, that's dope. They're like, yeah, bro, he's paying tomorrow. Huh? A sale is not closed 
until there is money in the bank. Write that down. A sale is not closed until there is money in the bank. If you get a, hey, I need to transfer money. Hey, I need to sort out my finances. Those people are like most likely not going to pay. Some of them do. I'm not saying that no one will, but most people aren't just like living their entire life as like credit card free. Most people have credit cards. They have debit cards. Uh, and if they don't, they're probably not your target market anyway, right? But there's also the fear. So uh, yeah, I just need to talk to my wife. I don't ever make decisions like this without you know consulting her. Okay, cool. What? Just out of curiosity, like what do you think she would say? Boom, it's over. Um, and again, you just have to circle back to each objection, right? Um, money, like they're, they're afraid of losing the money. What's that money going to do for you? What do you think that money in your account is doing for you? Just sitting there. Well, it's just losing value. So you can either A, let that money sit there, or you can spend money to make more money. And what I've learned is the wealthiest people that I know and that I've ever seen in this space, they buy money, right? You're buying into a business model, you're buying money, right? So if you're selling like B2B or BizOp or whatever, that's some uh, uh, one objection handle that you can use there, right? And then also there's the belief in themselves. That's where I ask them, like, do you believe in yourself? Right? Do you believe in yourself? If they say yes, let's do it. Let's do it. I see you as a great fit. I see that you can change your life. And I don't want you to hold yourself back from making that decision to change your life today. So if I could do X, Y, Z, you know, would, would you be offended in any way? That is one way to put it. Right? Right? Um, if they say, no, I, I don't, I just don't believe in myself. Well, how come? Oh, you feel like you're a lazy. Well, so was I, when I first started the program, so was X, Y, and Z when they started the program, but they got X result. It's a case study. Boom, 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 bam. If you don't believe in yourself, you're never going to get anywhere in life done. Mindset. They're, they're afraid of, you know, whatever it is. Fear will hold people back from making decisions and they'll get paralyzed in fear and they'll get stuck in one spot and they won't be able to move forward. The people who make the things, the, the, the people who make the fastest decisions are typically the ones who get the best results. Um, and all the high level elite people, they make fast decisions. They have abundance, right? And so they're able to make fast decisions, right? But here's like a process called looping um, that we sometimes use. I've seen this in a lot of different places. I stole this from somebody, so don't quote me. But, um, you know, if they're like, hey, I need to talk to my wife. Well, that's not a problem. Is everything okay? Okay. Um, would you be open to seeing it in a different perspective? You know, and then what do you need to put yourself in the best position to achieve your goals? So we're just basically going to circle back on each problem, right? Um, and then also you could say like, if it's price, okay, that's not a problem. Tell me if you did have the funding, would it be something that you, that was interested for you? And what that does, uh, where did that go? Right, right here. What that does is what's called problem isolation or objection isolation, right? And that's where we isolate that problem down to one thing. So that eliminates every other objection. That's not a price objection that eliminates it right there in that one sentence. So they're going to say, oh yeah, of course I would do it. It's just an issue. It's price, literally just price. All right, cool. So we actually have payment plans. We can split that up. Boom. They can't bring up any other objection because they said it was literally just the price. Um, so that's like a, a kind of way. And, and sales, I hate to describe it as like you have to trap your prospect, but you kind of do. It's like just making a full logical and emotional foolproof plan um, for them, right? So here's kind of how to overcome some other objections. I'm not going to go over all that stuff, but these are the main um, 10 objections that you're going to get. I need to think about it or let me get back to you. Uh, I need to talk to my wife. And also in that, I need to think about it. I can also include like, okay, shoot me an email with some details. Um, they're not ready to make a decision. They're just looking for now. Price is too high. They don't want to buy without certain features. Uh, you know, I, I don't really want to buy it without one-on-one -on -one calls or whatever. Uh, what's the best price? Not sure if it's going to help me actually achieve my goals. They've been burned in the past. They had, you know, do you have any more testimonials and case studies? There's ways to handle all of those. I'm not going to go over all of those. Uh, but what I would recommend you do is write down all 10 of these and build an objection handle for your specific industry and for each of these um, and, and write them down, right? So yeah, that's what I do. 
And these are kind of like the biggest mistakes that I see most salespeople make, right? They're framed wrong. They have commission breath. So people can tell like if you're just in it just to get commission because sales is typically a commission thing. People can tell if you're just in it trying to make money or if you're actually genuinely trying to help your prospect. If you're not genuinely trying to help your prospect, fuck you. Like you need to actually believe your product will help them if you want to make that sale or else people will be able to sense it and you're not going to sell anything. Right now, another huge, huge point is that inbound and outbound are treated completely differently, right? So if we have a bigger team, we're running a bigger operation for our clients. We might even split out those teams, but typically we just want to train different things. Um, so your outbound script, whether it be for dialing, whether it be for whatever is going to be different, right? Now we're not going to be asking like any sort of, you know, risky questions. That's one thing that I see a lot of people mess up is they don't have the tolerance to be able to ask those risky questions and you need to be asking risky questions. Uh, not having a nice IG, you have an IG that's like, just has one photo on it or it's like a photo that looks like shit. You know, it looks like you were taken in the hood. Like no one's going to respect you. You need to have a clean looking profile um, that has clean profile picture, clean bio, looks like you're him, right? You need to have aura. And then also just not following up with those leads before the call and getting those no-shows. So as far as certainty goes, this is the way that I like to describe making your customers certain, right? They need to be certain in these four like facets or, or areas, right? They need to be sure that it's relevant to them and it's applicable to them and can actually get them that result. Um, and that goes into number three, which is results. They need to be able to get that result. They need to trust your reputation and your company's reputation, and they need to trust you and have rapport with you, right? And they need to have rapport with you, your product and your company. So these are like the four things that you need in order to increase certainty and get them to actually close. All right, so if you want the full document that has full objection handles in it uh, and some other sauce in here, go ahead and comment uh, and I can either send it to you or, um, fuck, I messed that up. I don't know why I said that. Um, you can click the link in the description. I'm so used to filming shorts. I just filmed 30 shorts today. Um, but yeah, go ahead and click the link in the description. You'll be able to take it. You'll get taken to a page, not looking to sell you anything. You literally just put in your email, um, your phone number and your name. And yeah, basically that is pretty much it. We'll send you that document. And another quick bonus hack for you is just like, look at what your day looks like, right? What, it, well, how is your day structured and when are you taking calls? Um, and make sure your calendar, this is from more of a sales systems aspect, but you need to make sure that your calendar is actually optimized for getting the calls when people are going to show up and optimized to reduce the no-shows, right? So you should have a calendar link, whether it be Calendly or Go High Level calendars. A lot of people hate on Go High Level calendars. Haven't really had that much of a problem with it, so I continue to use it. But you can use Calendly. You can use whatever. I don't really care. Uh, I don't get paid to tell you that. Um, but basically, you got to have a calendar link. you got to be able to send them that calendar link. That calendar link should be open uh, as in as little as four hours as out, right? So if it's 12 noon, it should be open at four. You want to close it off for the day. You block that in your Google calendar and you link your Google calendar to Calendly or to, uh, wherever you have those calendar bookings at, right? Wherever you have your main calendar at. So, um, you do that and then you push it out a maximum of three days, a minimum of four hours, a maximum of three days for booking notice. Um, and that will solve a lot of your no-show problems. And then in addition, you need to be having those automated sequences, the automated follow-ups, the automated uh, pretty much everything. So, What's going on? So if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a comment with any sort of sales questions you have. And then go get the document in the description as well. Uh, so that way, at least you have that script. At least you have that framework that you can work off of when you're going through sales. Now, if you have any questions, again, you can shoot me a text. My cell is down below, at least until I get to like 100K subs. For now, my cell phone is down below, so shoot me a text with whatever questions you have, and shoot me an email as well if you got any other questions. But other than that, hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and peace.